Hey everyone and welcome back to By Holly G. Welcome to today's video. As you can tell from the title, we are basically going to be looking at the female reproductive system. We're going to be doing a bit of anatomy and physiology. We're going to be looking at the menstrual cycle, the ovarian cycle. I seriously wish I paid more attention to this stuff in school. I remember learning about it, but not really paying too much attention to it. So I really want this video to be accessible. I want you guys to finish watching this video if you get to the end having learnt something and take something away from this video. And if you do know anything about me in my personal life, you will know that I have recently started to speak more about periods and open up about my period story. So I just thought it would be really fun to talk about this from a purely biological perspective. So yeah, I'm really excited to sit down and film this video with you guys. If you do enjoy this video, definitely give it a thumbs up. As usual, comment down below if you have any questions or video ideas. And yeah, if you want to stick around, and learn biology with us. As part of the biology community, you can subscribe and hit the bell, but we are gonna jump into this video because I have a lot to say and yeah. First thing we do need to address as kind of background to this topic is what is a hormone? Hormones are basically defined as chemical messengers that are released from a gland. They then travel in the blood to a target site where they bind to receptors on that target site and that leads to a particular effect. Now, the key hormones that we're talking about in the menstrual cycle, there are four key hormones. I'm not saying they're the only hormones involved, there are others. We basically have FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone. We have LH, which is luteinizing hormone. We then have estrogen and we have progesterone. So the first two, FSH and LH, they are what we call peptide hormones. So a peptide hormone is a hormone that is a peptide and a peptide is basically a small sequence of amino acids joined together so it's kind of like a smaller protein by contrast you have estrogen and progesterone they are what we call steroid hormones so steroids are particular types of lipids and a lipid is what you can think of as a fat as we'll go on to look at and talk about fsh and lh they are released from the pituitary gland which is a region in our brain whereas estrogen and progesterone are released from our ovaries themselves so down south and then leading on from that we're just going to talk a bit about the female reproductive system so we're going to do a bit of anatomy just so that we know what we're talking about the female reproductive system i'm going to be showing you a diagram of the uterus obviously the uterus is basically a muscular organ that is involved in pregnancy you know it supports the development of the embryo and the fetus but the lower part of the uterus is what we call the cervix the second key thing that i wanted to mention about the uterus was the fact that the wall of the uterus is divided into three layers so we have the innermost layer which is called the endometrium we have the middle layer which is the myometrium that's the muscular layer and then we have the outer layer the perimetrium going back to the myometrium as i said that the middle muscular layer that is responsible for undergoing contractions that lead to childbirth that middle layer is also responsible for contractions obviously milder contractions but they help in the release of blood during your period so that is the reason why a lot of people get abdominal cramps during and around their period you know just adding a bit more detail then that endometrium so that innermost layer that can be divided again into two layers so we have the stratum basalis basalis however you want to say it but stratum means layer strata means many layers so we have the stratum basalis and that is adjacent to the myometrium and then we have the stratum functionalis or functionalis however you want to say it again and that is the layer of the endometrium that will thicken and then shed during your period so that is the layer that we're talking about that is going to be undergoing the changes during the menstrual cycle and obviously on this diagram you can see the ovaries and they are apparently the size of like almonds and that's a lot smaller than i thought and then the fallopian tubes which are also known as oviducts the thing that i always forget actually about the female reproductive system is that breasts or boobs they are also part of the reproductive system they're considered accessory organs they aren't involved directly in like the ovarian and menstrual cycles that we're going to talk about but they will be affected by those cycles they are affected by the hormones released so now moving on to the main part of this video we're going to be looking at the ovarian cycle and the menstrual cycle so these are two cycles that basically go hand in hand often most people think of the menstrual cycle but we do have the ovarian cycle as well and they both span a duration of about 28 days however that can vary like between individuals and within the same individual delineating these cycles they start on the first 
day of your period and then it will end on the first day of your next period so that is your full cycle and as i said we have the ovarian cycle which basically describes the changes that occur in your ovaries and then we have the menstrual cycle which is referring to the changes that happen in the uterus the lining of the uterus specifically remember the stratum functionalis of the endometrium we're firstly going to start with the ovarian cycle and then that is going to tie into what i'm going to talk about with the menstrual cycle this is basically split into two phases so we have the first follicular phase and that starts on the first day of your period and it runs up to day 14 roughly day 14 at ovulation when an oocyte is released from the ovaries and then the luteal phase is the second phase of the ovarian cycle and that obviously starts at ovulation and it continues to the end of your cycle so the start of your next period and it's normally during the luteal phase well basically after day 14 in your cycle when people experience the symptoms associated with a period so like your pre-menstrual symptoms that lead up to you having your next period and that is because of the estrogen and progesterone that are being produced during that time mostly so those symptoms can be anything from like bloating to headaches to fatigue to breast tenderness to headaches you know like there are so many symptoms and they are all related to these hormonal changes so we're starting with the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle so yeah in our brains basically we have the pituitary gland as i said before now the pituitary gland is split into the anterior and posterior pituitary gland and it's the anterior region of the pituitary gland that is responsible for releasing fsh and lh because what essentially happens is the hypothalamus which essentially controls what the pituitary gland does it releases a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone and that travels a short distance from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary gland and tells that region of the pituitary gland to release fsh and lh and fsh and lh i didn't say this before but as well as being peptide hormones we also say that they are gonadotropins and gonadotropins are specific types of hormones that act on the gonads gonads are your sex organs so in females we're talking about the ovaries so once gonadotropin releasing hormone tells the anterior pituitary gland to release fsh and LH they will be released into the blood and then they travel down our bodies through the blood to the ovaries where they bind to receptors and they cause an effect so firstly with FSH its name as I said before is follicle stimulating hormone and hence that name it stimulates the development of a follicle now the follicles are basically describing the developing oocyte so an egg cell surrounded by supporting cells and those supporting cells are the granulosa cells and the theca cells those two supporting cells as well as surrounding and supporting the developing oocyte they also release estrogen which is one of our steroid hormones but that release of estrogen from the granulosa and the theca cells that is stimulated by lh which is luteinizing hormone so we have fsh which is stimulating follicular development and then we have lh which is stimulating the release of estrogen from the surrounding cells in the follicle if you want to know a bit more about estrogen i should really say estrogens because there are three types of estrogens the main one and the most abundant is estradiol estradiol no estradiol i'm pretty sure that's how you say it. my pronunciation gets worse every single video i'm so sorry but i'm just gonna say estrogen for simplicity of this video but just remember that we do have multiple types of estrogens at this point we're still in the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle but it's when it gets a bit more complex so what essentially happens is we have the development of these follicles and we are releasing estrogen from those surrounding cells and um, because we have rising production of estrogen that estrogen is beginning to circulate around the body we say it's circulating systemically now and that is able to travel back to the brain and it basically sets up a negative feedback loop so it tells the hypothalamus to stop releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone and so if we reduce the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone we're obviously going to decrease the release of fsh and lh from the anterior pituitary gland and the consequence of this is that because the follicles in the ovary rely on the production of fsh in order to develop it means that a lot of the follicles in the ovary are gonna start to die and the process of the follicles dying or collapsing and disintegrating is basically called atresia that is the biology technical term however there is normally one dominant follicle that despite low levels of fsh can continue to survive so it doesn't die by atresia so we end up basically with this one dominant follicle left as a result of this negative feedback loop and we're not done with the story yet so what this dominant follicle then does 
is it starts to release even more estrogen than we had before and again that estrogen circulates in the body systemically and this time instead of traveling to the brain to set up a negative feedback loop it sets up a positive feedback loop so it tells the hypothalamus to release gonadotropin releasing hormone and that then tells the pituitary gland the anterior pituitary gland to release fsh and lh again so we basically get this surge in the level of those two peptide hormones and the lh surge in particular that is responsible for ovulation so as i said ovulation is normally around day 14 of the cycle that is when the oocyte is released from the ovary that is ovulation and obviously that oocyte has been released from that dominant follicle that didn't die by atresia and that released oocyte it travels obviously in the fallopian tubes and it normally travels with a few surrounding granulosa cells but it's basically going to travel in the fallopian tubes and it's being pushed along and being swept by the beating of ciliated epithelial cells ciliated epithelial cells basically have these cilia, they're kind of like spaghetti-like structures that beat rhythmically. And that beating is basically driven by contractions in the small muscle associated with the fallopian tubes. And that in turn is stimulated by the rising estrogen levels. So we've obviously reached the midpoint of the ovarian cycle, that's day 14, around day 14, and we're moving into the luteal phase now. That dominant follicle has obviously released the oocyte, and under the influence of LH, because of that LH surge or the spike, that is now going to turn into a structure that we call the corpus luteum, and the granulosa and the theca cells of the corpus luteum, they now start to make progesterone. And progesterone, it's the second steroid hormone that I mentioned, that hormone again travels in the blood it travels back to the brain and it sets up a negative feedback loop to dampen the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone and therefore fsh and lh when i talk about the menstrual cycle i'll talk about the changes in the uterus but for now we're just going to remember that progesterone is released from the corpus luteum from the granulosa and the theca cells and it travels through the brain to set up yet another negative feedback loop so this secretion of progesterone it occurs for about 10 to 12 days and if pregnancy doesn't occur then basically the corpus luteum will break down into a structure that's called the corpus albicans and that is non-functional it's eventually going to be degraded and so the release of progesterone falls and as a result of the decrease in progesterone production it means that the hypothalamus can now start releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone and then fsh and lh levels can rise again and that marks the end of the cycle or the start of the next cycle so that's basically the ovarian cycle we're now going to turn to look at the menstrual cycle which as i said before that refers to all of the changes that happen in the uterus and it can be split into three phases but it is tightly linked to the ovarian cycle the first phase of the menstrual cycle is obviously your period when you menstruate and this usually happens for about five days on average obviously it can vary but basically the lining of the womb or more specifically as we now know it's the stratum functionalis of the endometrium that will shed and this shedding is ultimately due to that decline in progesterone so we finished the ovarian cycle talking about progesterone production being halted because the corpus luteum breaks down and that decline in progesterone it allows the shedding of the stratum functionalis and at this point the levels of all your other hormones so fsh lh and estrogen are all quite low the second phase of the menstrual cycle is called the proliferative phase and your period and the proliferative phase they basically coincide with the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle so everything is running in parallel as i said they run side by side now this proliferative phase it basically refers to the thickening of the lining of the uterus again it's that thickening of the stratum functionalis of the endometrium and that is basically due to proliferation of cells i'm not going to cover everything in the ovarian cycle again but hopefully you'll remember that in the ovarian cycle it was the luteinizing hormone so lh that stimulated the granulosa and the theca cells to release estrogen and in the ovarian cycle we talked about the role of estrogen in driving that negative feedback loop and then the subsequent positive feedback loop here the estrogen is basically responsible for thickening the lining of the womb you know stimulating the proliferation of cells in the stratum functionalis so that layer thickens that is the role of estrogen in the menstrual cycle and this proliferative phase it basically ends at 
at day 14 when we have ovulation and that was due to the LH surge again as I talked about before. So the third and final stage of the menstrual cycle is then the secretory phase and with the luteal phase in the ovarian cycle if we go back to that that started after day 14 after ovulation had occurred and similarly that is when the secretory phase starts in the menstrual cycle so they now run in parallel up to the end of the cycle and basically they are both driven by that release of progesterone and remember progesterone is released from the corpus luteum and the corpus luteum is that structure that is formed after the follicle has released the oocyte and it's kind of like just been left with the surrounding cells. And before I talked about progesterone and its role in setting up that negative feedback loop to dampen the release of FSH and LH, here what progesterone is doing in the menstrual cycle is it's causing the lining of the womb or the thickness of the stratum functionalis to be maintained. It's basically maintaining the thickness or maintaining the lining of the womb. And that is in preparation for pregnancy. If fertilization occurs and you get that fused cell called the zygote and then you have the embryo if that is formed it needs to implant somewhere and so it's going to implant in that thickened lining and as i said before that progesterone is going to be released for about 10 to 12 days and if pregnancy occurs it's going to continue to be released but if pregnancy doesn't occur then the corpus luteum is going to break down into the corpus albicans we're going to dramatically decrease the release of progesterone and then the cycle can start again so it allows fsh and lh levels to rise and then we go back basically to the start of the ovarian cycle which begins with the follicular phase and the start of the menstrual cycle which is the breakdown of the lining of the womb the shedding of that in your period just for completeness of this video i feel like we need a summary of everything all in one we're going to start on day one of the cycle the hypothalamus in your brain it releases gonadotropin releasing hormone and that acts on the anterior pituitary gland to cause the release of fsh and lh which then travel to the blood and they travel to the ovaries the ovaries are their target organ now fsh is firstly going to stimulate the development of your follicles and then you have lh which is going to stimulate the follicles to release estrogen so estrogen levels are now going to start to rise it's going to cause the stratum functionalis of the endometrium to proliferate it's going to start to thicken and it's also going to start setting up that negative feedback loop so we have the dampening of the release of fsh and lh which causes most of the follicles to die but it's going to allow one dominant follicle to survive and that dominant follicle then releases a big load of estrogen so estrogen levels rise quite dramatically and that surge in estrogen sets up now a positive feedback loop which causes is a peak in both FSH and LH and it's the LH peak in particular that drives ovulation the release of the oocyte from that single dominant follicle so we've hit the middle of the cycle we've hit ovulation what happens after that is the follicle which is now released the oocyte that breaks down into the corpus luteum and we start to get the rise in progesterone because progesterone is released from the granulosa and the theca cells of the corpus luteum now that progesterone is firstly going to set up a negative feedback loop in the brain so we have a decrease in FSH and LH and at the same time it's going to maintain the thickness of the lining of the womb it's going to prepare the endometrium for pregnancy and that is going to happen for 10 to 12 days if you are pregnant progesterone release will continue but if you're not pregnant then the corpus luteum will break down into the corpus albicans you will have a decline in progesterone that allows FSH and LH levels to start to rise again and that marks the start of the next cycle when you will begin to menstruate and the lining of the womb will basically shed so yeah I hope that made sense and and that is everything from start to finish. Overall, I think the way to view it is that, you know, it's like really incredible that our bodies do all this stuff for us. And yeah, as I said at the start, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Definitely give it a thumbs up if you did enjoy it. Comment down below, subscribe. And yeah, as always, I will speak to you very soon in another video. Bye guys.